now in any case if you uh, if i got disconnected let me know uh, i mean as soon as possible last time i think we had some incident mm. <clears throat> we missed some slides and i discussed because of some technical issue let me know now uh, we were discussing about financial institutions and we started looking at financial intermediaries the definition and the nature of financial intermediaries in a financial system there are two types of financial institutions uh, financial intermediaries and service providers so we had a lengthy discussion on the intermediaries why they are important what kind of a role they play in the financial system and in the financial system i think the the most prominent uh player is the intermediary in terms of their contribution in the financial system and intermediaries could be various you know uh, i mean forms for example if you look at this uh, table we looked at uh, various forms of intermediaries like depository institutions such as banks contractual savings institutions such as pension funds and insurance companies and also investment intermediaries like investment companies merch merchant banks etc etc so we looked at their basic uh, uh, type of their uh, liabilities or how they collect money what are the sources of the funds and then we have already look, also looked at how these funds are used which means the assets of these institutions i think that's where we stopped last week i hope uh, you can hear me can you hear me yes okay uh and <clears throat> we will look at uh, various types of intermediaries in this session starting from the banks banks are the most important intermediaries and we will have a you know some lengthy discussion on the banks compared to other financial intermediaries uh, among these intermediaries uh, there are some important players and uh, i have listed down these intermediaries in this slide I'm not going to you know list read out the list but let's discuss uh, in the uh, uh slides what we have in the uh, slide show uh, and also uh, there are some financial institutions uh, they are providing uh, non intermediary services as well an intermediary usually they are set up is if you look at the you know the framework of an intermediary <clears throat> they basically collect funds from the surplus units and collected by them as the intermediary by then it is channel to the deficit units this is the simple framework of intermediation and whatever the institutions i have listed here banks finance companies investment banks <clears throat> they are basically subject to this framework in general however there are some institutions or intermediaries they are not only providing this intermediary service they also provide non intermediary services <clears throat> for example some financial institutions they provide financial advisory services you don't take any deposit to any don't give any loan or whatever but they simply providing some advice some uh, support to clients and there are some companies like fund management companies they will do fund management on behalf of you they are also like intermediaries but they don't do any intermediation but in an, uh, other than that they do some non intermediary service non intermediary service means uh, simply they don't take surplus funds and channel it to deficit units but some other services 
so uh, that's one part the other aspect is the savers and surplus units rather than going through this financial intermediary they can go to the borrower or the deficit unit directly <clears throat> directly in the financial markets that is also some non intermediaries uh, or uh, sometimes we call them as disintermediation financial disintermediation disintermediation means rather than going through this uh, you know the surplus unit the deficit unit and the financial intermediary as the middleman just meeting the required parties directly in the stock market what happens is is like a financial intermediate disintermediation which which means there's no middle person involved uh, in terms of taking funds and channeling funds to the market so those are some uh, you know variations or some uh, different situations in financial intermediation i'm just telling you these terms because that could be in your exam what do you mean by non intermediation or disintermediation so the simple idea means uh, surplus funds are channeled to the deficit units directly or financial intermediaries providing uh, some support services which cannot be classified under financial intermediation Let's keep that in mind i i told you other than the financial intermediaries there are financial service providers in the economy uh, i will discuss these providers at length uh, towards the second part of this discussion uh, but similar to financial intermediaries they are also providing these financial service providers they are also supporting the financial system sometimes financial intermediaries they cannot perform their duty without the support of uh, financial service providers so they are in modern world especially when we have some technology driven financial systems and technology plays an important role in today's context these financial service providers are very important they are always very important so what they do basically they do some fund transferring uh, remittances transferring uh, there are some credit card companies there are companies issuing financial guarantees guarantees means giving some you know kind of a uh, undertaking uh, on behalf of someone else financial derivatives are there payment service providers like card providers card uh, uh, like you know paypal company for example they are payment service providers money changers are there dealers sometimes brokers some exchanges are there security uh, depositories are there safe custody services they are also in in our financial system all these are basically uh, like uh, financial service providing we will have a look into these when we go for so today's plan <coughs> we discuss intermediaries in detail in the previous part what we had is some definition some background to these intermediaries and service providers and we need to understand who are these provider uh, say intermediaries and what are the main functions of these intermediaries to answer the exam questions we need this knowledge the role of these intermediaries and why and how they are interacting in the financial system what are the new developments so those are the areas in the exam paper if you look at the recent exam paper in 2021 we will see i think later on we will get some questions from that as well there are some new areas emerging emerging so we have to have a understanding and discussion on these 
uh, new areas as well. So we will do in, in our sessions. So amongst the financial intermediaries, the most important financial intermediary is the bank. Banks. So banks are in various forms, right? I mean, banks in the sense there are money taking banks, there are, you know, even the data banks, even the blood banks are there. So what we meant here is banks as the financial intermediaries. They are the main financial intermediaries. Now, if you look at the banking history, <clears throat> it has a long history. If you have read some history, the history of banking goes back to, I think, uh, even the uh, before Christ era, BC period. I think we find some uh, evidence on the banking system, banking systems in uh, British, sorry, in uh, Greek civilization. So Greek civilization is like, you know, 6th BC. And thereafter, some remains or some evidence is presented in the Roman civilization. The Greek civilization was defeated by Romans and Romans developed their own culture and you know finance systems and all that. I think in terms of banking, the Romans are the most influential in the uh, prehistoric era. So thereafter, the banking business in the world gradually developed, especially during this uh, Renaissance period in the 14, 16, 14, 15, 16 period. And the rapid development can be observed in the uh, industrial revolution, uh, comparative to industrial revolution in the 19th and 18th and 19th centuries. In the 20th century, we see a significant expansion in the banking especially due to the <clears throat> technological advancements in the countries. We know starting from 1960s, especially uh, the computer technology was emerged in 1960s mainly. And then uh, payment card innovations were introduced since 19, early 80s, like uh, I think late uh, 70s, credit cards and all that. So with that, the banking system uh, improved significantly all over the world. Uh, to support this expansion, as I said, the technology played an important role. Other than technology, uh, in many countries, the banking system was actually liberalized. Liberalized in the sense, the free activities in the market was allowed. So in the past, banks were heavily regulated, or regulated in the sense they are heavily controlled. But since 1980s, in many countries in the world, the banking systems were liberalized. Liberalized in the sense they were allowed to engage in foreign transactions, uh, foreign banks can come and operate, uh, you can, you know, establish a bank in a foreign show, uh, banking scope in this uh, form of dis dif different services, both intermediary and non intermediary expanded. So, likewise, the banking system became very uh, dynamic in the 20th century, especially uh, during the latter part of 20th century, that is after 1980s. Now, it's even more. I think uh, in the 21st century, we know now the banks are experiencing rapid changes, especially due to the uh, 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 introduction of this smart technology, smart technology, cloud uh, computing, cloud technology, 
financial technology artificial intelligence lot of things have happened in the 21st century in the first 20 years if you look at the last 20 years there is a rapid jump in all these you know technological advancements uh, so the banking business have become very uh, modern dynamic and also challenging because of the uh, uh, the expansion significant expansion and we know technology is anyway risky uh, the technology can bring about positives which means uh, gains benefits as well as negatives to a financial system and a bank because uh, you know sometimes technology can do a lot of things uh, above the traditional uh, methods or traditional ways or means so which, which means uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, changes in the uh, financial system in the banks uh that's very i mean briefly on the broad developments in the banking as a whole and if you look at this uh, table sorry the slide you will see uh there are there are banks which can be considered as global banks so here i have presented a chart from an economics magazine uh, what are the largest banks in the world uh, this is based on 2016 rank it may have changed a bit now but not much so if you look at this table at the chart uh, uh, these banks for example icbc china uh, their capital size is given capital in terms of uh, billion dollars so the icbc capital is can you imagine 300 billion plus dollars the one of the largest bank in the world then the Chinese Construction Bank, Bank of China, all these, uh, and Agricultural Bank of China, if you look at all four major banks, even now, if you take the you know latest information, Chinese banks are the dominating uh, banks in the world. In the past, actually, these US banks like JP Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup, they were the largest banks in the world now if you look at this chart they are sig still significant they are within the first 10 banks but chinese banks have overpassed overcome the i mean uh, they have achieved the position uh, surpassing the us banks and also hsbc it's like it's a british bank mitsubishi bank it's a japanese bank now in general, if you look at these 10 banks, mostly China, US, Europe dominate the banking industry uh, in terms of the size of the banks. Uh, even in Sri Lanka, I think I have a different set, uh, discussion on Sri Lanka, but before we move, I think if you look at the history of uh, Sri Lanka uh, banks, banking history, uh, even we have a kind of a uh, large, a long history. I think mostly our modern banking system emerged in uh, twenty, so in in the <coughs> colonial period, especially when. Uh, British uh, took the control uh, of Sri Lanka economy and the financial system. We we see uh, some uh, uh, developments in the banking system. But if you go back to the history uh, in in Sri Lanka, also we can see some early signs of banking especially during our uh, you know periods of uh, civilization like anuradhapura polonnaru we see some uh, 
evidence of banking industry in Sri Lanka. Uh, I think you may have heard a lot of inscriptions are there in Sri Lanka, uh, which we call them uh, cell lipi. So in these cell, uh, cell lipi inscriptions, one of the famous inscription is, uh, I think, uh, Thornigal, Thornigal inscription, right? Tonigala inscription, cell lipi. They are, uh, I think we have information on a banking system, which means they talk about interest, they talk about giving money as a loan. So some evidence is there from our uh, history. Uh, so Sri Lanka also has been operating a banking system. And, and we know, I think in the museums you may have seen, uh, even from these, uh, I mean, history of 2,500 years ago, we find, you know, currency, notes, coin, special, sorry, coins, especially uh, used in the uh, financial system and the monetary system. So, which means some early signs of banking and financial transactions were there in the Sri Lanka as well. So, that is some, you know, additional knowledge before we move. So, what is a bank? It's a financial intermediary accepting deposits and channeling those deposits into uh, lending and investment activity. So financial intermediary is basically accepting the deposits and those deposits are used by the uh, banks for two activities actually, lending and investment. Now, traditionally we call them as institutions who are accepting deposits and giving loans that was the traditional you know the definition but if you look at in modern context if you check the bank balance sheet you will see they are not only giving loans so their assets not only the loans the asset side is also composed of investment activities so most banks nowadays they do investment they buy shares they buy treasury bills, bonds, they invest in uh, other private activity, private investment avenues, real estate, uh, even the gold, all these are like their investments. So it's appropriate if we define a bank as a financial intermediary that accepts deposits and channel those deposits into lending as well as investment activity. So here in this uh, diagram, probably you can write investments as well. So both are included in modern context. And if you look at the banks, they are the most uh, regulated financial institutions in most countries. In many countries, banking have a long history as well as in many countries, they are the most closely watched and controlled or supervised regulated institutions. So the focus on the banking system is really high in many countries because one thing, they are very large, very big. In most financial systems, the banks are the largest institutions. Even in an advanced country, they have alternative financial institutions and the markets, but still banks are playing a big role. So banks have the largest share in the financial system. So as a result, it has a importance, which we call as the systemic importance. So due to this systemic importance, you have to closely watch it because if any failure of the system of the bank will have a systemic problem. If one bank collapse, that could lead to uh, collapse in many banking institutions and the financial system. Right? So it's very common in many countries you have banks as the main financial institution. So as a result, they are very significant. 
the other reason as i said uh, 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 systemic importance is there one thing the size the other thing banks are dealing or doing business using other people's money so they accept deposits means that's other people money not their own money so banks own money is very little if you take the balance sheet in the balance sheet their own capital is very low in most cases it's less than 20 percent 15 percent in general it's like 10 percent it's own capital so 90 percent is actually coming from the depositors so banks business base is built by the depositors so it's a peculiar situation which means banks balance sheet indicate the larger reliance on other people's money so in that sense banks have responsibility to be secured and also to serve their client base because they do business on their money to ensure that banks are highly regulated so the regulated indicate regulation indicates the banks are closely supervised monitored and uh, uh, regulated by issuing various uh, directions various determinations by imposing laws etc etc because of their systemic importance systemic as i said the collapse in one institution could lead to other could uh, i mean uh, affect the other institutions and there could be a overall problem in the financial system okay third point in the slide in the modern banking world uh, in the financial system uh, banks are important because uh, the money and banks are tightly or closely uh, related because in the modern society we know money is important for financial transactions or uh, money is supporting the real economic activity uh, so money is playing some important roles remember the money is functioning as a medium of exchange money is functioning as a storage of value money is functioning as a unit of account even money is functioning as a deferred method of payment which means you can settle all these activities or functions can be easily fulfilled through the banking system so in the modern world the banking system is very supportive and very important for the uh, uh, i mean the banking system is important for the functioning of money so fulfill the functions of money you have to have a banking system for example if you want to do a transaction one way you can use currency notes and coins sometimes you get currency from the banks through the banks because our mostly our transactions are done through the banks so you need a bank then sometimes you need to make a payment a check payment or a card payment whatever all these are modes of transactions medium of exchange so that is facilitated through a bank if you want to settle debt as deferred payment you do it through a bank so it's very difficult to fulfill the functions in modern world of uh, functions of money in modern world without a banking system so banks are playing some important economic functions mm. in general these functions uh, can be classified 
uh, as economic functions and here I have given you some operational functions as well economic functions means basically I mean in, in terms of conceptual concept what does the bank do and when these concepts are you know operationalized what what does the bank do I think both are presented here so economic functions of a bank can be you know identified as credit intermediation credit intermediation means simply you can call it financial intermediation same thing so which means banks borrow and lend from whom banks borrow banks borrow from the depositors in terms of deposits they get money from the uh, depositors banks also borrow money i mean from the lenders that's a different thing but as i said the main channel of funds of the bank is deposits so these deposits are collected and lent we call it as the intermediation maturity transformation we already know i think in the previous week also we discussed they are collecting short-term money and lending for long-term purposes for example the banks are collecting deposits a maximum period of five years short term the relatively short term but they have to lend it for more than 20 years 25 years 30 years even so there is a maturity gap the transformation is done by the bank settlement of payment means banks are acting as collecting and paying agents as we already know uh, they are helping for interbank clearing check clearing and all that that is a part of banks function economically speaking money creation is done by the banks i think you remember our discussion on money supply the central bank money when it is injected to the financial system that central bank money is parked in the banks commercial banks and commercial banks are using this money to provide loans in the financial system that loans create more money so banks are creating this money through their activities we already know the settlement in the settlement account they maintain some reserve balances these reserve balances can be changed through a ratio and through that the banks are controlling the i mean power of money creation but still uh, the banks are able to create money in the uh, uh, process okay so when you put these economic functions into action you may call it operational functions operational functions we can identify as primary functions and secondary functions primary function we already know deposit accepting and granting advances so when they accept deposits we know there are savings deposit fixed deposit current accounts and uh, recurring deposits means you know uh, the continuous deposit even the cold deposits they have granting advances in various forms can give overdraft can give cash credits can give loans discount bill back bills can be discounted as a loan so all these are primary functions secondary functions actually the agency functions and uh, utility functions agency functions means sometimes fund transferring is supported by banks payment uh, is done through the banks collection of checks uh, portfolio management uh, all these are coming under agency functions utility functions i told you there are some non-intermediary services provided by provided by banks for example you can get a draft from a bank draft is a kind of a financial instrument you can get it from a bank locker service safe cut safe custody facilities they are provided by banks underwriting project reports and all that all these are secondary functions uh, now this economic functions as i said 
are basically transformed to operational functions due to the uh, actions of a bat due to the uh, uh, functions of a bat due to the functions means they are basically operationalizing these economic functions for the operation function uh, now i hope you are there right i'm still on the lecture do you follow me can you hear me yes sir. okay we are there so sorry someone said something can we move let me check the chat box whether you have any issues or questions right we are the new movie okay now uh, <clears throat> banking it's a business business in the sense banks uh, support the market by providing the required banking services and they earn money income and profit uh, by charging for this service so banking is not a charity business charity it's a business so businesses are always based on a profit we know why profits are needed you have to compensate your stakeholders for example you have to compensate your shareholders so the banks are owned by shareholders you have to give a dividend a return for the shareholders even for the depositors to pay a better rate to serve them better you have to have a kind of a reasonable profits so how these banks are making profits we already know banks are converting their assets right so they do some asset transformation they collect deposits as liabilities and convert into loans and investments which are the assets so through this process banks are creating profits through the asset transformation so how this asset transformation is done asset transformation is done through the banking businesses so there are major banking businesses we already know they do deposits deposit taking is done borrowing is done banks are also borrowing from others from the interbank market from the stock markets they they raise money uh, so that is basically related to their sources of funds then banks are basically lending this money and investing this money to generate profits generate profits that is basically how these funds are used by a bank to generate profits in addition they do provide payment and financial services as we already seen banks are supporting fund transferring card payments uh, online payments etc etc all these are to support the financial system so they are whatever the activity they do in this blue uh, shaded area is with them uh, with a view to make a profit so all these actions are done by banks to generate profits and we already know why profits are important to uh, support their uh, uh, stakeholders right then we we'll need to look at the 
bank business model what kind of a model they have what kind of a uh, uh, framework they have in terms of uh, to generate profits now uh, banks are generating revenue through their actions activities in terms of interest and transaction fees and financial advice fees so these are the revenue items now if you take the revenue function of a bank they have interest income plus non interest income so interest income means i think that's very clear how or what they generate through their primary business primary business is what accepting deposits and paying giving loans you accept deposit at a particular interest rate give loans at a particular interest rate so that interest you generate by giving loans is the interest income that's one part the other part of interest income is banks are as i said they are doing investments they investment in financial securities so when they invest they generate an income so this investment in, in sorry in interest income may also capture that investment income as well right then that is the most traditional or the most uh, in, in many cases the largest share of revenue is coming as interest income today's context as we already know banks are providing services uh, on various aspects they are providing non intermediary services as well for example as i said they can do uh, giving some financial advice to someone they can do a project report project monitoring evaluation they do uh, foreign exchange business buying and selling foreign exchange they do share business they do uh, uh, lc opening and all these things which generate fees or charges so this non interest income means fees charges commissions things like that so banks revenue is supported by this non interest income okay so how the banks profit is decided the banks profit is simply this revenue minus cost equals profit so this cost can be in different forms mainly the interest cost and other operational cost let's forget about the other of op the operational cost interest cost is the main cost interest cost means what they pay on their depositors what they pay for their loans if the bank have, have has borrowed they have also need to pay uh, interest so this difference is simply reflect in the profit of a bank now a very crude measure very you know overall measure 
to understand the bank profitability is uh, can uh, profitability can be discussed here as we already seen banks are mainly in the intermediary business which means they are accepting deposits and giving loans for that matter they charge interest and pay interest as you already know so the deposit interest and the difference between the take some space here for low uh, deposits you have to pay deposit interest rate okay. for loans you get loan interest rate so the difference between this loan interest and deposit interest is a proxy for their profitability profitability can be denoted by phi which in turn in banking language we call it nim net interest margin net interest margin so this interest income if you deduct the interest expense broadly what you get is the net interest margin there could be some other adjustments when you properly calculate it but broadly the idea is the difference between interest income uh, sorry a, a interest earned and interest paid is the net interest margin so the bank's most important source of income is the net interest margin which is coming from this interest income but what happens this net interest margin is volatile interest income is volatile we know interest rates are changing in the financial system interest rates are changing time to time due to various reasons central bank policies uh, the position in the market the conditions developments in the market how market is liquid whether they have funds or not depending on those things the market is changing and as a result interest rates are changing but this non-interest income which is coming from fees charges commissions and all that it is like a stable revenue stream it does not change what really could happen the volume could increase and the revenue could increase but you will see you know very less volatility in this fees income fee income you call it as a stable revenue scheme so what i want to summarize in this point uh, in this uh, uh, slide is simply the banks are working or functioning as a uh, financial institution to generate profits so when they generate profits they are following a business model so in this business model uh, they do <coughs> generate interest income and non-interest income sometimes interest income is called as uh traditional revenue stream because most of the banks traditionally they were basically based upon this interest income non-interest income people call it as non-traditional interest so non-traditional income because uh, we have seen uh, in the last many years maybe in last uh, three to four decades the non-interest income portion has increased 
in many countries in many banks so that is reflecting the changing nature of the financial uh, system and uh, you know the expansion of the financial services in the economy the other than the you know loan taking and depositing there are many activities happening in the financial system so with that we are able to divide the bank's business activity into two areas one is on balance sheet activities the other one is off balance sheet activities so on balance sheet activities are broadly related to interest based activities off balance sheet activities are broadly related to non interest based activities so when you say non interest based that those are fees charges commission etc so the total bank income i told you of this r is coming from both these interest and non interest activities means from both on balance sheet and off balance sheet activities so let's define these on balance sheet and off balance sheet activities on balance sheet activities contain uh assets that the bank own and the liabilities that the bank has to pay so these are on balance sheet activities means they are mentioned in the balance sheet now in the balance sheet you know there is an asset side there is a liability side so simple t account right so in the asset side you have loans you have investments etc etc real assets etc on the liability side you have deposits you have you know share capital you have loans etc so these are appearing on the balance sheet as i said liabilities could be deposits borrowings capital these are appearing on the balance sheet in terms of assets cash investments loans fixed assets these are appearing on the balance sheet so if a bank is based on the items appearing on the balance sheet we consider them as on balance sheet activities so the bank's main business revenue coming from the interest income as we have seen so this interest income is actually related to on balance sheet activities because banks are accepting deposits giving loans and advances which means you generate a new net interest margin so that is a no balance sheet so on balance sheet activities activities mentioned in the balance sheet either as a uh, asset or a liability since these activities are mentioned on the balance sheet and they are based on interest activities interest based activities you call them as interest based activities or sometimes you call them as fund based activities fund so in textbooks if you see these terms interest based activities or fund based activities that indicates on balance sheet activities which are mentioned on the balance sheet uh, as i said these are recorded in the balance sheet the difference between these assets and liabilities now for example i simply draw an asset and liabilities here so if you take the total assets and if you did up the liabilities in terms of deposits and borrowings the difference 
is generally considered as the capital right so this capital is people who brought into the business that capital sometimes you call it net worth of the bank why it is called a net worth this indicates the bank's ability to withstand a shock or the bank's ability to absorb a shock because this is owner's money net worth owner's money means people who brought in money any shock will have to bear by them so that is called as net worth so if you i mean break this net worth there you have shares you have retained earnings you might have reserves so all these form net worth sometimes you call them as capital funds so central bank is very particular about these capital funds because it should be there adequately in order to face any shock that could arise due to the uh, unforeseen events occurring in the financial system now these days is a best example why the banks are facing worldwide problems because of the covid-19 pandemic due to the pandemic lot of economic activities are held up so as a result people are unable to pay so when people are unable to pay the banks have to bear the loss of that so that loss where do you charge that loss you have to treat it in the financial statements so most banks have i mean the banks absorb this shock or the loss to the to the capital funds so you should have enough capital funds for net worth in order to absorb this shock that's why the central banks are basically uh, guiding banks to have adequate capital in our i think last session we will discuss this capital funds in detail where you look at regulatory capital minimum capital ratio uh, uh tier 1 tier 2 type of capital so likewise there are various buffers against the uh, any possibility of making losses so high net worth is very important for a bank so i think i already mentioned this fund based or interest based activities the net interest interest income generated by the banks are this uh, off bal on balance sheet activities which we consider them as fund based activities now here we have a sample balance sheet to understand this fund based co interest based activities of a bank now i have taken this uh, uh, illustration from textbook mishkin why i took this uh, illustration whatever we have in this uh, balance sheet is common for many countries the way of presenting the balance sheet could be different depending on the accounting principles and all that but in general in a bank you will see these items that is the you know common format for a balance sheet so depending on the country circumstances it could change in in particular country you might have different types of assets different types of liabilities but in general most countries or many banks have some common items so let's look at these common items and try to understand the balance sheet 
scale on balance sheet activity. So here what they have produced is the balance sheet of all commercial banks. So this is a kind of a consolidated balance sheet for the banking industry. First we have the asset side. I told you asset side is what the bank owns, right? How the funds have been utilized, whatever they have received as funds, they have to utilize. So the way of utilizing the funds or the, the allocated, the way of allocation of these funds can be understood from the asset side of the uh, balance sheet. So on the other asset side of the balance sheet, we basically have four major items. First, you have reserves and cash. Reserves and cash means, reserves means what, uh, remember, central bank is requiring commercial banks to keep a reserve at the central bank. I hope you remember, under statutory reserve ratio, banks are keeping a certain amount of money in the central bank. So why do you consider them as an asset? And on this balance sheet, your assets are ordered or listed based on the order of liquidity. So depending on the liquidity, you, uh, I mean, list these assets. The, the, the first asset is reserves and cash. I think cash, we know it's very liquid. Whatever the transaction, you can, you know, give it and you know you can convert very easily without any due. Cash is very clear. Why reserves are considered as liquid assets? Why they are at the top? Any answer? Let me hear something new from you. Can someone want to, I mean, uh, is it possible that someone gives me an answer because I can't see the chat here? Why reserves are considered as highly liquid assets? Let me check whether you have written something. why these reserves are you know considered as assets and why they are considered as liquid assets is anyone having any answer because we cash it which means cash it means i appreciate shiran you have an answer What do you mean by that? Why it is liquid? Whatever we have at the central bank, why it is liquid? Usually this class is very active, you have answers. Why? Today is very silent. Only one person is responding. We hope others are there, not sleeping, right?
resource can be easy to uh, convert to cash? Yes, uh, you're right. Whatever available at the central bank, yeah, liquid assets means assets that can be easily converted to cash. The rate of converting to cash is higher, correct? Because we can easily convert into cash. They all, all are correct. What does that mean? Whatever the money available at the central bank, you can easily get it, isn't it? If a commercial bank is having money at the central bank, you can, I mean, in terms of liquidity need, you can get it very quickly. You have to fulfill it again. That's a different thing. But you can utilize that money. For example, let's say the bank is having a large withdrawal on that particular day. People are coming to the bank to withdraw money. Let's say now new year is coming for the new year period. The banks are, you know, with money, people are withdrawing money. Sometimes bank might not have enough money in their vaults. So what can they do? They can easily use their money available at the central bank, the reserve. Then you have to fill it up again, but you can use it. That's why you call it highly uh, liquid. So if I go back to my pen again, the reserves and cash items are there. This is an on balance sheet item. Then you have securities. Number two, securities means simply investments. Okay. So in this US balance sheet, what are the securities they have? US government agency, state and local government agency securities. So which means these particular banks, the, the banking industry, they have invested in government security or any other securities. That is the second type of asset. Third type of asset is the most important one, loans and advances. Now, if you look at this loan portfolio, they have number of type, I mean, different types of loans, commercial loans, industrial loans, real estate loan, consumer loans, interbank loans, various loans are there. And if you add up these different types of loans, you will see uh, it accounts more than I think 65% of the balance sheet. The total of this, I think, closer or more than 65%. So you can see the largest category of the asset of the bank is loans, even globally. This is global information. So that's why we can say very easily the bank's main business model main business is intermediation. Fourth type of asset is other assets such as physical assets, the, what the bank has in real assets, even the goodwill, some people they value it and include in the balance sheet. So all these are asset items, how the funds have been used. So all these assets mentioned in the balance sheet so that's why you call it on balance sheet activities similarly liability side what you have is information on the usage of these funds how the funds have been used so sorry not the use uh, sources of funds i'm sorry sources means how these funds have been collected who gave money to these banks? So here we have information. In this bank, back in industry, checkable deposits. We already know checkable deposits means current accounts. Then they have number two, non-transferable deposits, which means savings and FTs. If you look at this explanation, you will see small denomination time deposits, savings deposits, etc., etc and large denomination time deposits. So if you add up all these three, all our deposits now, something like 65% again 
coming from the deposits. Then we have borrowings. I told you banks borrow. Banks borrow from other banks. Banks borrow from other institutions. Banks can borrow from the, you know, public by way of, you know, issuing instruments. So all these are reflected in the balance sheet. And the third item I told you, sorry, third item, bank capital. And if you look at this balance sheet, capital is only 7%. Maximum, this could be 10 to 12%. So this is the only money that the owners have brought into the banking business. Other than that, if you look at 65, 28 means roughly over 90% is other people's money. That's why I told you the banks are dealing or doing business mainly based on other people's money. So this is very common even for other countries, advanced countries. Uh, the largest category of their, their uh, liabilities are coming from the deposits and loans. Okay? So all these are appearing on the balance sheet. So you can call them as on balance sheet activity. Now here I have an example illustration from a local bank. I extracted this from an annual report of a particular bank. And in that annual report, you will see these assets liabilities are presented, not in this form. Assets and liabilities are one followed by the other. But uh, if you put it in a T form, T account form, T form means T account form, you will have assets on the uh, left hand side, the liabilities on the right hand side. Now, can we identify those four categories here? Four categories, reserves, cash items, securities, loans, other assets. So the, those are the major items. Now, if you look at the asset side of this balance sheet, you can identify the same. Now, cash and balances with the central bank, placements with the central bank, even the, sorry, reverse repurchase just agreements. All these are reflecting cash. Then derivatives, financial assets, assets uh, for trading and collaterals, all these are reflecting investments. Then you have loans, receivables for to banks, loans received to other customers, other loan receivables, etc. etc. You will see these are loans. Then others you can put it as other assets. So in the other assets you will see property, plant and equipment, intangible assets. I told you this, uh, even the goodwill, you can make it as an asset. Now, very clearly you can identify those four categories. And if you look at this bank, what is the largest share of asset? Coming from what? This 259 is related to what? Loans and receivables to other customers. Which means as a bank, they, they are loan portfolio. So it's very easily detectable from this balance sheet. Liability side, what do we have in the liability side? Mainly you have deposits, borrowings, and capital do we have it on the liability side due to banks uh, due to other customers all these related to actually due to other customers due to banks these two reflect the deposits I 
actually uh, due to banks means they are let me redo it i'm just i mean broadly categorizing this due to other customers this 300 the largest size is actually the deposits and due to banks these two are actually indicating the deposits then you have this number two sorry number 37 which means debt issued to other and borrowed funds this 38 something is loans and there are small small items i'm not going to you know i mean to be bothered on those things these are some other balance sheet items what i want to highlight is broadly if you look at the most important two categories are the deposits and loans the largest two categories then the third item I told you, capital funds. In this equity part, you have the capital funds. I told you capital funds will be in stated capital, which means share capital. Then you have reserves, statutory reserves, other reserves, and retain profits, retain earnings. All these form the capital funds. So what we have observed in this slide as a format, assets and liabilities reflect in the unbalance sheet activity and be easily detectable from this example. This is an actual example, as I said, from a local bank in Sri Lanka. So likewise, I think uh, in your commercial banking uh, discussion, or in your commercial banking uh, subject you might be discussing this in detail uh, more than uh, what i have discussed here under the commercial banking subject but this is just to have some brief idea which is sufficient at this stage in no finance sheet activities off balance sheet activities are actually not mentioned in the balance sheet they are not recorded in the balance sheet why they are not recorded in the balance sheet now here the assets and liabilities they are generating something creating some assets on the balance sheet of off balance sheet activities they are not an asset or debt or it's not a financing activity that can be recorded on the balance sheet they are actually <clears throat> termed as contingencies and commitments to the banks so these are actual actually not transactions they are like having some agreements that's why you call it commitments contingencies means they are temporarily arranged if it is realized then it could be transferred to the balance sheet now the basic example is there are some loan lines credit lines so when people are given a credit line that is becoming a contingency for example, you have a 10 million credit line, which means you can borrow up to that 10 million. What you actually borrowed is 5 million. So 5 million should come to the balance sheet because it's already realized. That unrealized part is basically a commitment or a contingency. So they are not recorded on the balance sheet. 
so as i said some activities like financial services derivative trade trading uh, providing lcs guarantees uh, exchange rate transactions foreign exchange transactions all these are considered as contingencies and commitment that are not reflected in the balance sheet so these activities i think i already mentioned to you generate either fees charges commissions etc etc you will see there's no activity uh generating interest among these so none of these activities generate interest among these so as a result you call it non interest based activities or you may call it off balance sheet activities so these off balance sheet activities are considered as fee based activities or they they generate fee income so if you really observe the term fund based activities and fee based activities they are referring to on balance sheet activities and off balance sheet activities on balance sheet activities can refer as fund based activities off balance sheet activities can be referred as uh, fee based activities so here we have an example for off balance sheet activities this is again from that uh, bank now this information is not directly observable from the financial statement now you know in a bank annual report at the beginning you have financial statements you have the balance sheet you have the pnl you have the cash flow statement changes of equity statement likewise there are various financial statements in the financial statements you will not see this off balance sheet activity you can find the information on off balance sheet activities under the notes so under the notes you have these commitments and contingent liabilities information right now i told you commitment for unutilized facilities i told you you can give a credit line and you are only utilizing part of that the balance part is coming under commit contingent liabilities i told you you can provide you know various facilities like document credit which means lcs guarantees bills collection acceptance all these are financial instruments right so foreign exchange transactions swap transactions none of these activities generate any interest income right no interest but they generate fees so generating fees means they are considered as off balance sheet activities so in modern context if you look at advanced countries uh they are traditional banking volumes becoming i mean they are reducing traditional banking activities means what is available on the balance sheet these activities they are actually reducing diminishing because banks are moving from traditional business to actually it has happened already but still it's continuing they are moved from traditional business to non traditional business or basically off balance sheet activities i told you, you no know, remember banks are generating a stable revenue out of this stable non interest income so banks prefer 
doing more and more off balance sheet activities in order to secure their uh, revenues, to secure their profits. So in this slide, I have just uh, mentioned what type of banking services are available. Banks are engaged in various types of banking. Retail banking is there, which means dealing directly with individuals and small businesses. Business, sorry, banking is there, providing services to middle level, I mean, uh, some medium to small scale businesses corporate banking is there providing services for large business entities for example listed companies large conglomerates they are provided corporate banking facilities private banking is provided for wealth management purposes and etc for high net worth individuals and families people who are very rich uh, they have private banking facilities. Uh, even uh, I think personal banking facilities even that is available even for ordinary customers. That is also one uh, variant of this. Investment banking is there related to investment activities on the financial market. So these are some traditional types of activities played by banks but as i said in modern world banks scope have changed they are into some other areas like offshore banking universal banking etc etc now offshore banking means what do you mean by offshore banking simply providing banking facilities for foreign entities foreign companies if there are foreigners, foreign companies operating in your country, you can provide offshore banking especially for them. In Sri Lanka, every commercial bank has an offshore banking unit to facilitate these foreigners and foreign companies. In Sri Lanka, we have domestic banking unit and the offshore banking unit, which means providing services to the foreigners universal banking is also a concept applied by the banking industry where a lot of services are provided under one roof usually a bank would provide a few services no we have seen deposit taking lending investments and all that but in modern context as i said from this slide we have seen banks are engaged a lot of engaged in a lot of off balance sheet activities disintermediation or non-intermediation activities they all come under universal banking concept so universal bank is providing a large number of financial services under one roof beyond the traditional bank providing large number of financial services under one roof beyond the traditional bank so even under this one roof you can have all these traditional activities deposit taking borrowing lending investment etc also non-traditional activities could also be there providing insurance providing fund management services providing investment advice uh, helping for portfolio management foreign exchange transaction real estate transaction even uh, stock market activity all these are beyond the traditional banking aspect so this activities if they are performed under one roof you may call it universal banking 
In Sri Lanka, we don't have this universal banking concept as yet, I mean as such, but a lot of banks are doing a lot of activities even though we call them as commercial banks or specialized banks. But in some countries like uh, Germany, they are very popular for this concept of universal banking. You can Google and see your universal banks in German. Uh, you will understand they are providing a lot of services, even the development banking activities are provided by the universal banking. Okay. So these are different classifications. In addition to this, if you look at your past papers, you will see there are other variants as well. What are these other variants? Like we know, internet banking is there. Online banking is there. Phone banking is there. Mobile phone banking, right? Likewise, there are various models are there in terms of banking activity, banking businesses. Let's look at a couple of exam questions. I think then we will be having some idea what type of questions available in the exam paper in terms of different activities. Uh, last part for the today, risk. Now, banks face number of risks in their businesses. Risk means, in broader sense, risk is the uncertainty. What do you mean by uncertainty? the possibility of making losses if it is related to the financial industry the risk means the possibility of making financial losses so risk is everywhere and for the financial sector the risk is very common and it's an inherent feature of a financial system. Similarly, banks are facing number of risks in their businesses. Large number of risks are faced by the bank. So in these two slides, I'll be looking at those different types of risk. Okay. Because this is very important. And if you look at past papers, I think in every exam paper you have question on the risk faced by banks or in general the financial system what are the main risks faced by a bank starting with the credit risk the credit risk sometimes you call it as the default risk default risk means the risk that the people are avoiding to pay back as promised Sometimes people default on the principal, sometimes on the interest, sometimes on the both. So the risk of loss arising due to this default, you can call it credit risk. The most prominent risk paid by, uh, faced by a bank is the credit risk or default risk. I think last week we discussed uh, two concepts that moral suasion and adverse selection, remember? So this moral suasion and adverse selection is actually, so not the moral suasion, moral hazard. Moral hazard. And adverse selection so both 
are related to this credit risk. So that's the main risk faced by a bank. Then there is liquid risk, which means inability to convert any security quickly to prevent any loss. So sometimes you call it liquid risk means unavailability of cash. I told you, you know that SRR it support in the liquid risk when the banks do not have enough money to pay for their depositors SRR is helpful so by that way you are avoiding the liquid risk you are having enough cash third type market risk so market risk is happening due to the changes in prices in the market so due to the changes in prices your value of assets will change your value of portfolio will change what are these prices available in the economy there are interest rates asset prices exchange rates etc etc so as a result the market risk is having various sub risk one is interest rate risk risk arising due to interest changes then we have asset price risk risk arising due to interest rate risk asset price risk risk arising due to the changes in asset price exchange rate risk which means risk arising due to the changes in the exchange rates so these three are the most important risks faced by a bank and among these three the credit risk is the most crucial there are some other risks as well operational risk coming from the failure of companies business functions there could be reputational risk which is related to the loss of trustworthiness of business that is very important if a bank loses the trustworthiness the reputation that's the end of the business so that is also there macroeconomic risk which means risk related to the broader economy in the economy now these days is a very good example now under the covid pandemic the growth of economy is low so this risk is coming from the macro economy growth low means people are unable to pay back so non-performing loans are going up broadly overall in every country so that is a macro economic risk in addition in modern world i think you will see this in the exam papers as well there are some new risks like cyber risk due to the technology so risk associated with the financial loss disruption to operations or damage due to the negative event occurring in the information systems and information management systems etc etc cyber attacks uh, all these are related to the cyber risk there is a question on your paper uh, let's try to get those questions next week uh, i mean what type of cyber risk that you can face there are various cyber risks as you are aware there are phishing emails there are hacking right there are uh, system uh, malwares all these are cyber related risks okay so we will have a look in look at on those questions as well but broadly have some idea cyber risks okay so when the banks are facing these risks the banking business is facing some challenges so you have to address those challenges for that matter banks are having risk management practices so risk management practice means banks are adopting required measures and controls 
to manage this risk. So in order to manage this risk, banks are having some minimum levels of certain resources allocated to manage the risk. Now every bank, you will see these uh, requirements available. The central bank is imposing the requirements to the banks that they should follow these requirements. What are these requirements? They should have enough capital, which means capital adequacy ratio is uh, largely or broadly followed by a uh, bank. There should be enough capital, capital adequacy. Why? We have seen the capital is an absorber, shock absorber. So if a bank is facing a credit risk, people are defaulting, there should be some mechanism to absorb. That mechanism is the capital. There should be profitability in the bank. So there is no as guidance in the banking industry. You have to earn this much of profit, but at least some reasonable profit you have to have. Out of this profit, you can, you know, accumulate some of the profit to your capital funds in terms of undistributed profits or retained earnings. Liquidity. Bank should have enough liquidity in order to face the sudden withdrawals. To facilitate that in the banks, there are com uh, committees called Asset Liability Management Committees, ALCO Committee. I think it's a very important committee in bank. Uh, banks should have, as I said, uh, we already know, uh, uh, SLAR, not the SR, SLAR, statutory liquid asset ratio. This is to ensure enough liquidity is available. Now there are new ratios, net stable funding ratio. Liquidity coverage ratio is the LCR, right? Those are some measures applicable to ensure enough liquidity. I'm not going to define these things. Probably I have a separate session on these, uh, but just keep that in mind. There are various measures implemented by the uh, implemented for the banks to ensure enough liquidity. And there are good management practices and corporate governance principle. I think after the crisis, global crisis, banks are much worried about their internal management practices. They should have a corporate governance uh, because corporate governance is one of the key concerns relating to failures of the systems, failures of the um, reputation. So all these risks can be addressed if there are proper corporate governance principles. Corporate governance also, I'll be you know looking at it in a separate session um, when we come to. The bank's uh, stability, right? Our last session. Compliance with the prudential requirements means central banks and other authorities, the governments, they are imposing certain practices, certain uh, requirements, especially the regulator. The bank should adhere to these uh, compliance. For example, the central bank would say, okay, you have to have this much of uh, capital you already mentioned you have to have this much of liquidity you have to have this much of you know branch network you have to have this much of atm network right all these are measures to comply that bank should comply in order to reduce the risk that they are facing okay? so the key message here is the banks are facing risk there are a number of risks faced by a bank. Those risks can be mitigated if there are proper risk management tools, risk management mechanisms are there. That is the message that we have to take from this. Right, I think uh, it's time to stop. We are done with the key financial intermediaries, banks. Uh, and next week, we will be covering in a uh, 
uh, session in, the, in within the session we will be covering the other available financial intermediaries very briefly i have the slides i think in detail but my discussion would be very brief because we just need to understand the nature and the functions of these institutions not in uh, i mean in depth uh, let's try to find out some time for exam questions because for these type of uh, uh, topics we have to look at the exam questions because there are some if you look at the latest paper also as i said there are some new ideas new areas have been captured in the exam so we have to focus on those as well so let's try to find some uh, find some time to answer the exam questions shall we stop here then